Welcome, specialists, coaches, dads of kickers, moms of punters, relatives of long snappers, and dogs that shag kickoffs to the Iceman Kicking Podcast. It's the show with cold questions and even cooler guests. We are here to talk about the ins and outs of special teams and specialists. And I am your host, Brett Arkellian. Before we get into the episode, a few reminders. We encourage you to tweet about today's episode. Tag us at Iceman underscore kicking and use the hashtag Iceman kicking podcast or cool under pressure or big kick energy to let us know what you enjoyed about the episode or any recommendations for who you'd like to see on the podcast next. Also, if you are interested in any of the fantastic information discussed here today, you can find all of this and more in the Kicker's Bible proven training methods and secrets used by professional specialists by yours truly, Brett Arkellian. It includes tips from over 20 NFL specialists, along with numerous personal accounts from Eagles Hall of Fame kicker David Akers and current University of Florida analyst and ex-NFL kicker Shane Graham. Visit IcemanKicking.com or go to our Twitter bio to purchase your copy today. Now sit back and get ready for one cold episode. You know, if we were last in the country returning punts, I might not be on the podcast. So shout out to the uh, R&B team. Hey, and everyone listening, man, y'all order my dog's book, man. Y'all stop playing with my guy, man. Iceman Kicking, go get the book, The Kicker's Bible. Order the thing, support this young man. Right. Today, we're very excited about this guest here, the Iceman Kicking Podcast, for a number of reasons, all right? First of all, this is the first time we've recorded an episode in the same building. This is the first Conference USA coach we've had on the Iceman Kicking Podcast. And also, it's the first time we've had a guy with a red beard and some flow going on. So very excited for Kyle Siegler. Kyle, how are you doing today? I'm doing outstanding, Brad. Anytime I get to spend time with you, it's just it's just a little slice of heaven. Exactly, exactly. This is something I look forward to. Uh, you know, let's do a little bit of background first before we get into it, talking about the special teams coordinator and tight ends coach for the Marshall Thundering Herd. Kyle Siegler hails from the Lone Star State. He started off his coaching journey in 2009 at Lawn Morris College in Jacksonville, Texas helping out a program that was discontinued in 1945. After that, he was at Sam Houston State for eight seasons, where he coached offense line and tight ends and added the duty of special teams coach. Now at Sam Houston State, he had four All-Americans and also coached a South End Offensive Tackle of the Year. Sam Houston State broke 35 school records. He went on to University of Louisiana Monroe, where he was the tight ends coach and special teams coordinator. After moving on from to Louisiana Monroe, he came to Marshall University, where he has coached a phenomenal group of tight ends, special teams uh, units. Now, Kyle, welcome to the cold seat. All right, the highlight of my day is when I get to hang out uh, with these fantastic coaches we have here at Marshall, and you're one of those guys. I appreciate it. It feels great to be on the cold seat here on the Iceman podcast. It's, yeah. it's a pleasure. You're looking very pricey. I do say so myself. Now, before we get into anything today, we're going to have a word from our sponsors. This show is brought to you by The Kicker's Bible. The Kicker's Bible. Do you want to learn the ins and outs of kicking from NFL specialists? Organize practice schedules for in-season and the off-season so you don't overkick? How to get a full-ride scholarship offer? The perfect long snapping technique for tossing a 6-5 ball on the hip every time. This book provides specialists with the ultimate guide containing everything necessary to find success as a specialist at the highest level. Brett R. Kelly combined over 10 years of experience as a player and coach with countless hours of research to develop this handbook of the greatest collection of proven technique tips used by college and NFL specialists and coaches all in one place. The Kicker's Bible is a must have for both players and coaches at every level who want access to information essential to perform and teach at the best of their ability. Go to icemankicking.com to get your copy today. All right, so let's talk a little bit about your background, Kyle. You obviously come from family coaches. Your dad was a coach 
Uh, you have a letter from Mac Brown, okay? Who influenced you and your coaching methods? And who is someone in your career that you model yourself after? Uh, well, you know, you kind of touched on it uh, briefly, you know, coming from a coaching family, uh, you know, although my dad was, you know, basketball coach, you know, for, for his whole career, and, you know, my older brother uh, coached basketball as well. Um, you know, it's just kind of seeing the interaction over the years, to be totally honest with you. Um, you know, my dad obviously coached me. Uh, he coached my brother as well. Obviously, that was a really cool thing to get to play for your old man. Um, and, you know, just seeing his interaction with guys over the years, uh, I think the biggest deal with my dad was always kind of just being himself. Uh, you know, I never saw a different guy at work than I did at home. Uh, he never brought it home with him, but at the same time, I think I always respect the fact that he was just himself. It wasn't fake. It wasn't, you know, trying to put a persona out there, you know, and I think a lot of times when you're a young coach, you know, guys try to feed off of what the, what's, I guess, what's the, the crowd wants, if you will, you know, guys want to be different than who they are. And eventually if you're, if you're keeping up a persona or a personality and that's not who you are, that's going to fade and it's going to be hard to maintain, you know, and I think that's the one thing with me that, you know, being a young coach, you know, I, you know when I was at Sam Houston, you know, as a, as basically a unpaid quality control, you know, I was around some really good guys, really good coaches, um, you know, Derek Wareheim and I worked together at Sam Houston, uh, helped him with the offensive line, obviously in those first two years I was there and, uh, you know, spending time with him, another young energetic guy, high intensity guy, you know, but, very similar in personality and sense of humor and attitude. I think, you know, he and I kind of gelled uh, off the field as well as on the field. And, you know, kind of he also taught me a lot as far as, like I said, you know, just, just being okay and being comfortable in your own skin, you know. And, again, this is so much more off the field nowadays, especially with relationships and time you spend with your, your players. And, and it's not always on the field or in the meeting room, you know. So, again, kids – Kids nowadays can smell a rat from a mile away. And if you're fake and you're not who you are, you know, all the time, then they're not going to buy into what you're selling as far as what you're teaching from a philosophic standpoint and also just your interaction with them. You know, if you're fake and you're phony, they're not going to buy in all the way. If you're you and you're honest, people will usually uh, do, do whatever you ask of them as far as how, how well you're able to motivate them. No, I think you're 100% right with that. They can smell the rat, as you, as you like to say. Um, you know, and that's important, those relationships. That's what I'm learning as a young coach. Now, you touched on it a little bit there, talking about Sam Houston State. And, you know, I wanted to dive into your experience there because you guys had a ton of success there. You went to two national championship games. Talk about what that experience was like. I know you played there. You got the helmet in the background. Talk a little bit about that. Uh, well, you know, I mean, it's anytime you get to have success and, and coach at the place where you went to school and you played, um, obviously, that's a tremendous honor. Um, you know, I was very, very blessed to be able to, again, start out as an unpaid, you know, quality control there at Sam when Coach Fritz got hired. And I owe a lot of the success that I've had and opportunities I've had to being a part of that staff young uh, as a young coach. And Coach Fritz gave me that opportunity. Um, you know, I think the one thing that he instilled in me, which obviously had instilled in me, you know, as a, as a player and as a kid, you know, coming up how I was raised by my family, you know, but Coach Fritz, just the mentality of the program at Sam during that successful era and going to those national championships with just being blue collar. I mean, Coach Fritz, you know, if there's trash in the floor in the hallway, you pick it up. If there's a, you know, after the ball game's over with and a road game, the team, we unload the, 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 the budget truck. You know, it's not the managers, you know, the players and the coaches, we carry the stuff. You know, you're never too big to do a menial task. And I think that's, that attitude I've carried with me, you know, throughout my career. Uh, I think nowadays, a lot of times players included, but also young coaches think things are below them. And, you know, it's not flattering to make coffee. It's not flattering to make co copies and draw cards all day and have them immediately thrown away right after ball practice over whether you spent hours doing, you know, and that's none of that stuff's cool, but that's what coaching is. And I think, you know, that, that timeline that we were there, we had a really blue collar staff. We had really blue collar kids. And, and bottom line is we just outwork people. And, you know, do we have some talented teams? No question. I mean, between Tim Flanders and Brian Bell and Richard Sincere and all those guys we had, I mean, we had some animals, you know, on the team, but we, we worked as well, you know. And, and then at that time period of my career, you know, Coach Fritz has made a career off of emphasizing the importance of special teams and how that is a culture within your program, 
And, you know, I understood from early, early on in my career that, you know, that is not just, you know, we're exchanging the ball. I mean, that's, that's a way of life. It's a third of the game. And it's, you know, if your kids buy into that and believe that, you know, it's, it's something that, that again, it kind of permeates throughout your program, you know, and, and I, I, I mean, I, I was, I knew I wanted to coach, you know, I'm a coach's kid, I'm fourth generation coach. And I was a very average to below average player. Um, you know, I, I Again, I was a try-hard effort guy, you know, good locker room guy. I knew I was never going to be a star, but I wanted to have that experience to help me try to, you know, get into the coaching at the highest level. And, you know, that was obviously something I've had some great relationships. You know, some of those guys that were all young guys with me on that staff, you know, at Sam Houston, I mean, are some really talented, unbelievable coaches, you know, between Robbie Disher at Lafayette right now. Um, you got uh, Matt College, who's at Baylor. Dan Lanning was with us. DC of Georgia, Patrick Tony's the DC of Lafayette, you know, Weston Glauser's the DC at, at, at Campbell. I mean, we had some young coaches that were all on that staff and we cut our teeth together early on. And it was like, you know, it was kind of cool to have that experience working with those guys on special teams and day to day that, you know, we still bounce ideas off each other. We still work with each other. We still call each other and, and talk about things like that. You know, it's pretty cool to see how that those relationships have still developed and continue to be so strong. It's awesome, man. I love that, but especially with the young guys, you know, you want to grind together and then it's, you know, it makes you feel good when you see them succeeding at the highest levels too. Um, you know, and the other thing I liked, I know you love when I make comparisons between us, but I was the same way too. The only reason really I wanted to push myself and try to play at the highest level is I knew I wanted to coach, you know, so I knew I was never going to be at five freaking eight or whatever, a star at what I did. I knew I wanted to get that experience to hopefully get my foot in the door. And obviously for you, it paid off because you guys had, you know, a phenomenal team there. Now talk a little bit about, you were an offensive line guy, you know, and it's not a lot of times you see offensive linemen or offensive line coaches in special teams. So that role was put upon you in 2016. Talk about how that transpired and you know, how you went about handling that. Well, uh, I think it's no secret to anybody, you know, the, the common misnomer in the game of football is the smartest people are the quarterbacks. Um, that, is, that is not true. Uh, the smartest people are the offensive linemen. And a lot of times the offensive line coaches typically are uh, some upper level thinking guys as well. And, you know, to me, it's, 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 it's a multiple layers to it. It's, it's, you know, again, the first part of it with me specifically was, you know, when, when Coach Pallage, uh, I mentioned earlier, when he left to go to Louisiana Monroe, um, just on our staff, the dynamic of our staff at that time with Coach Keeler at Sam Houston, you know, just from a personality standpoint and also involvement in coaching and game planning of special teams, you know, it was a no-brainer for me to take over that role. Um, now, the one thing that, you know, I did, you know, do, a, in my opinion, I, I was very, it was very important to me to do is, is again, I talked about it kind of at the very beginning of this, you gotta, you gotta do it your way. And again, if you're not all in on it and you're not passionate about it and the kids don't get that same feeling and same energy from you that you do because you're doing somebody else's thing, it's not going to come off. It's not going to be as, it's not gonna be the finished product you want. And I think, you know, even though Matt and I obviously philosophically are very similar in what we believe in and what we like from a technique and, and, and schematic standpoint, just personality and delivery were a little bit different, you know, and Powell's a high energy, just juiced out of his mind guy. Well, I try to bring that same energy and same thing as well. But again, you kind of had, I had my own spin on it. And, uh, you know, it was something that obviously, you know, my end game and end goal is hopefully someday to be a head coach. And obviously I'd like to coach the offensive line between now and then, you know, but if you can manage and, and, and coordinate special teams, you definitely can, can, call ball plays on offense or defense or coach the offensive line, you know, because again, you're coaching guys from all different walks of life and you're on your team, you know, and I think that was something to me that was, was kind of, you know, my attitude about it. And, you know, if you, you make it a priority and you make it really important to the kids, the success on the field will carry over. And, you know, again, we kind of, you know, my initial kind of way I did things was we kind of paid homage to, you know, military groups and kind of had a little more militaristic as far as attention to detail structure and and you know intense focus on each phase and the kids ate it up you know we made it a big deal to be on those phases and you know to have those opportunities to go out there and do that and it's it's hard at the FCS level you know from a depth standpoint and a number standpoint you just don't have the bodies you do at the FBS level to where you can have guys who are just on one or two phases I mean you're talking at the FCS level I got guys that are, that are on all four 
you know, and, and playing on medium those snaps and offensive defense, you know, so you've got to find a way to reach those guys and make it important to them. And, you know, it's just kind of like I said, you know, it's, it was kind of a, not a, necessarily a shock. It was kind of a, you know, it was an exciting opportunity, exciting challenge, you know, and having coached on special teams is one thing, coordinating and game planning and having it fall on your head that if you're good on it, you know, you're productive and you play well on special teams, hey, good job. But if you don't, it's on you. You know, that was a different deal, you know, and obviously it was it was exciting and it was fun. And obviously, you know, it was an awesome opportunity for me to take a next step in my maturation as a coach, you know, and, and getting a chance again, trying to continue to develop my career and move myself forward in the business. Awesome. I went the JUCO route and we did the same thing a little bit where we are we named our units after, you know, military personnel and stuff like that. Is that something that you guys did? Because I think that's a really cool idea. How did you pay homage to you know, military in the special teams units? Uh, well, uh, you know, it's, it's funny you say that, uh, you know, the, the kickoff unit, uh, we, they were the Rangers. Uh, you know, Rangers typically are the first ones into battle. Um, obviously, you know, just full tilt, full go, hair on fire. Um, and that was obviously, that was, that was one of my favorite phases there uh, at the time. Uh, we did the same thing at, uh, same thing at Louisiana Monroe as well. I brought the same thing in there as well. Uh, same names and all that good stuff. Um, kick return was the SEALs. Obviously, SEALs typically go into foreign territory, unknown circumstances, unknown issues, and you gotta you gotta adapt and improvise. You know, kickoff obviously, or kickoff return standpoint, you know, you can game plan people, but you know, obviously, you got surprise onside kicks, you got squib kicks, sky kicks, and all the things you gotta adjust and, and improvise. And I think that's why we you know we went with SEALs for that. Um, you know, the Marines uh, was punt. Um, punt is arguably, you know, it's not really arguably, it is one of the most important phases in the game because you got to exchange football. Um, and, you know, the Marines are arguably the best trained and, and most technically sound units in special forces. And uh, our punt return unit was uh, was Ghost Recon. You know, we we're trying to, you know, again, trying to create some smoke and mirrors, some, some indecision on the other side, and also trying to be aggressive and trying to make an explosive play in the game, either in the return situation or block situation. But, uh, but we did it big. I mean, we had dog tags. Our, our ROTC, uh, ROTC director at Sam Houston, uh, he was an awesome guy, and uh, he uh, he did a lot for our team. And I uh, actually had him. Uh, he made real deal uh, Army tag dog tags uh, for for the units. And uh, you know, we had our players of the week. You know, you had big hit uh, who we are player, which was obviously just you know a guy just gets his job done and does things right all the time, and then. We had the Savage of the Week, which was kind of the combination of everything involved. And uh, those guys got an individual dog tag for that game if we won. And, I mean, you, you'd you be amazed at what dudes would do for a freaking dog tag. And, you know, again, it's it, it just it's verification that your work and your effort is paying off. You know, and you've got guys at the end of the year with five, six dog tags hanging around their neck. You know, again, that's, that's, a, that's a big deal. It's a prideful deal. And you know, our kids did a great job of buying into it and getting excited about it. And, you know, again, you got to – you got to have a little bit extra incentive sometimes, you know, it's saying, and again, I get it, you know, all in the, in the coaches are no different. A lot of times coaches, you know, you're more concerned about your positional group on offense or defense. And if something's going to slack or suffer, typically it can be your special team's responsibility as a role, you know, and, you know, we say it all the time, you know, you see kids a lot of times they don't, they don't pull themselves out offense or defense. But they may, Hey, you know what? This is that ninth kickoff coach. I'm going to go ahead and tap out on this one. Cause I got to go in and play linebacker. Like, no, nah, man, you know, we, we had a mentality there that, that it was the other way. Kids would pull themselves on, on defense or offense because, no, I got to – we got to go out here and run down on this kickoff or go out here on KOR and, and get after it. So it was, it was pretty special, the, the, the kind of culture that we created within the program. Sure, sure. And what I love about that is is the, you know, the mentality it gives those guys. Like, you know, if I'm on that punt unit, I know what's expected of me and I know what I have to go out and accomplish. That's cool because it unifies those guys. I really yeah. like that. No doubt. And it's, again, at the same time, it's just, you know, a lot of times special teams is just, it's a very physical deal. It's hard. It's hard work. And you know, a lot of times, you know, you got, you know, every day, you know, we're over there, we're running drills and doing, you know, doing extra in ball practice. And you got the quarterbacks that are standing on the side drinking water, you know, and talking about playing golf. You know, you got other position groups that are, you know, just kind of, you know, smoke them if they got them, you know, and you got guys that are, hey, I'm adding another 25 minutes to my practice every day because of special forces, you know, and again, you it was a way to pay homage to the people that, you know, obviously give us the ability to coach ball and have the freedoms that we have. But it was also, again, trying to emphasize how they don't just let anybody off the street go be a, a Navy SEAL. You know, you go through a lot of stuff to become one of those guys and to be an elite level player, you know, and, and to be on those phases. 
again, was an honor. You know, we, we did it. It was, you know, on any time we had a team meal or a team function, I'd always pick a, a special forces unit that would be the first one to eat, you know, and it would be, hey, if we had a dominant kick return team we're about to play, well, guess what? The Rangers are going to eat first because they're going to be the most important phase in this game and they're going to eat first. And you'd be amazed at how many times kids would be geeked up, ready to go, wanting to see who's going to be the unit that gets their name called to go up there and freaking eat first, you know. And just like I said, you got to kind of find ways to reach kids. And, you know, at the end of the day, if you can reach them and teach them, you know, that's what it's all about. It's gold, man. Some might say that's the gold standard. But also, Coach Crams, we're looking at you. Those quarterbacks are getting slacking off drinking water. All right. Hey, but your ULM days, too. Not only did you guys have success at Sam Houston State, ULM, uh, you know, you guys led were in the top 20 in kickoff and punt return averages. What set that that group apart? I mean, that's hard coming into a new, you know, new team and really making sure that they're top in the nation. What what did you guys do that really set you apart? Uh, well, the one thing we did there, which I was a really big fan of, um, and again, just from a number standpoint, we were able to do it. Uh, you know, we split the units as far as amongst the staff, and we also split the units amongst the players. And I think what we did a good job of was, you know, we personneled it to where, again, as far as a game plan standpoint, you know, it, you know, I, I broke it down. I game plan each phase. But, you know, I was in charge of the punt unit. And our head coach, Coach Vitor, who, again, it always – that's where the buck stops is if it's a big deal to the head coach and it's a priority to the head coach, it's going to be a priority to everybody. But, I mean, he, he ran our punt return team. And we went against each other every day in practice. And it was full tilt, full go hair on fire. And, you know, again, when you split it up the roles, you know, we basically, we personnelled it based off of priority of the units, you know, and punt obviously is the best of the best. It's the, it's the top players, the dogs are on punt. And then the next set of guys who are the dogs are going to be on kickoff. And then KOR and punt return, unfortunately at times they counter the Coles and they're the guys who are the try hard effort guys, you know, that you do, you can schematic, you know, scheme things with people rather than DNA things with people. But at the end of the day, punt and kickoff is about DNA. It's about who's running down there and, you know, and what kind of humans they are. And, you know, we, we really prided ourselves on those, those two phases, on all phases. But, um, you know, on as far as the kickoff team, you know, we were also really blessed. You know, we had a, a true freshman kicker, lefty kid who could just freaking bomb the thing. And if it wasn't a touchback, it was right on the, right on the money in the box where you want it. And I mean, just you, you just pin people so deep because it's so hard to get any field returns because of the kick placement. And God bless you if you try to go sideline return because we, like I said, we had some creatures running down there trying to do some bad things to people, you know. And in punt return, we were really blessed. You know, Marcus Green, you know, he was our kick returner, punt returner. He's he's a NFL current active roster player for the Eagles. I mean, he was he was really special, you know. And he was really really good. We we worked a ton of technique on those phases and. And kudos to Coach Vitor because I, you know, he's 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 forgotten more football than I know. He's one of the best football coaches that I've ever been around, and you know, he he did a good job of you know allowing me from a technique standpoint to change some things in our hold up looks as far as on punt return, and uh, we did a good job. The, the players bought in because Coach V and the staff bought in, and obviously the trickle down effect was positive production in that phase. And you know, obviously you got a guy back there like Marcus Green. You can get me out there and try to block for you. You got a shot to at least make some positive plays. Well, yeah, you obviously you had some dudes, and then also the technique and stuff you implemented set you guys apart. That's that's a fantastic job there too, you know. And, and I was wondering from a you know more of a personal perspective. Okay, you've been to different schools the last couple three four years, right? Bouncing around um, and moving on up in the ladder. You know, what do you do to you know establish relationships in those new schools? Because you might be you know a newcomer, and people might look at you like, okay, here's this guy coming from, you know, an FCS program. You know, how do you gain the respect, and how do you, you know, maintain relationships with those new coaches? Uh, again, I, I, I kind of alluded to it earlier. You know, I think it's about just being who you are, being genuine. Uh, you know, both of those spots that you're referring to, obviously coming from Sam Houston to ULM. Uh, you know, I I'd actually. Uh, I had interviewed at ULM for, for uh, the offensive line job the year before um, and really, I guess, you know, did a good job in the interview enough that Coach Vitor, you know, when the opportunity came for the tight ends, especially in the job that he called me and, and offered me the job. Um, but this business is, is the number one business in the world as far as relationships, you know, and that staff at ULM, we had so much fun and it was such an unbelievable staff because it was a bunch of blue-collar FCS guys. You know, it wasn't a bunch of high-dollar 
you know, Power 5 GA guys or Power 5 coordinators been all over the world. It was a bunch of guys who were in the Southland Conference, a bunch of guys who had coached it places where you do a lot of different things and you have a lot, you wear a lot of different hats, you know, and those guys, we had that kinship and we had that relationship from competing against one another um, and having that mutual respect as opponents, you know, as well as also just kind of some running in the same circles and having some same relationships with some guys. And then, you know, coming up here, you know, obviously this, this was the biggest change uh, in my career up to this point, you know, moving from, from God's country to, you know, West Virginia and, you know, obviously really only having a relationship with Coach Cramsey, uh, the offensive coordinator. And, you know, this is this business, like I said, is about relationships. And if you find somebody that you do have a true quality relationship with and you do have a connection with, you know, you, you, you try to try to keep those relationships strong and try to continue working with people if you can, you know. And after the success we had at Sam Houston, you know, I Tim and I had always, I always talked about, you know, obviously at some point we want to get the band back together, you know, and, and have a chance to work again together. And, it's been awesome, you know, and here it was a different dynamic. You know, I went from being the coordinator at ULM to coming here and only being responsible for one phase, you know, because we split it up as a staff and that was fine and I was good and obviously coached on all phases. And, you know, that part was, that part was the, as a transition was different for me. Um, but at the same time, you know, I was able to put my spin on things and how I wanted to do things in that phase. And obviously it's kind of been more or less the same as well now that the roles have expanded uh, into what, you know, we do here now. And so uh, it's it's just, again, the biggest thing is, you know, just being yourself and being honest with people. Um, again, it's, you know, you, you're, we're here all the time together, you know, and that's part of why I think this job is so fun and so cool because, again, it's just the amount of time we spend together, you know. And, again, you know, guys, just like I talk about players, coaches are no different. You know, guys know who are fake, phony type guys and people know who are real dudes, you know. And to me, at the end of the day, you say what you want about me, but again, you know what you're going to get. You know, I'm the same, I'm the same guy every day, same, same, same Kyle every day. You know, you're not going to get too high, not going to get too low. We're going to have a lot of fun, have some laughs. I definitely keep it light because this business, we're not, we're not, you know, building rockets. We're not curing cancer. We're coaching ball. You know, so let's just everybody keep that in perspective. And if we can do that, we can have a lot of fun doing this. No question. No question. You know, I noticed that uh, with our special teams units, you know, you guys do a great job with Coach Hankins of, of making sure the terminology transfers back and forth from both the units, you know. And, and I noticed, especially when I first came in here in March, you know, um, what a lot of people do respect about you is that realness and that rawness. I mean, answers like that to anyone, and I mean anyone. Do you ever have a time where you're like, man, maybe I shouldn't have said that, or, you know, just you just operate how you operate? I'll be honest with you, you know, it, you got to pick and choose at times. And there are some times that I've had to, I've had to, you know, you got to kind of walk a little finer line. Um, I think you got to know your clientele uh, as well. You know, I can, uh, if I'm, you know, obviously you're, you're in a, a, a team function or a, a home visit, obviously you got to curtail your, yourself a little bit, you know, but again, at the end of the day, I just, I, I just don't believe in that. You know, again, I'm just a uh, part of why I think I've been successful and I'm able to, to, to coach and teach kids the way that I do is because, there is no shades of gray. It's not, it's not, well, was that, you know, is that coach speak? Is that, you know, uh, is he just doing that? Cause it sounds cool. He read it in a, in a, in a, in a book somewhere. He saw in a clinic, like, again, to me, it's just, it's the, it's the transparency, you know, is, is, and again, you said it, I mean, it's, it's something that people respect because nowadays, and it's not just in, in football. I mean, it's in life. There's a lot of fake phony people and, a lot of people that are going to tell you one thing to your face and, and say something behind your back, you know, and I do take a lot of pride knowing that, you know, where you stand with me all the time, you know, that's not a, I wonder what he thinks of me, you know, you know, and good, bad, or indifferent, you know, and again, there, there are some times I'm sure I may have said some things uh, that I may not should have, but at the end of the day, to me, this business and just, and just philosophy on life is, I want to be able to put my head on the pillow knowing that I've been honest with everybody that I've talked to that day. And I've been, I've been myself, you know, cause again, once you start going down that path that you're going to change yourself with others and you're going to change your philosophy based off where you're at, that's not, you're not going to be successful. You're not going to, and you and if, if you are successful, you don't enjoy it the way that I get to enjoy it when we do have success, because I know that everything we've done, and everything we've, we've accomplished, we've done it to the fullest extent that we could. And those are the moments when you have those big plays, when you have the success of the team, that makes it that much sweeter because, you know, I got you did it being yourself, you know. And 
at the end of the day, if you put your head on the pillow and, and know that you've been honest and you've been yourself, then all the other stuff's just icy, man. Words to live by, Coach Siegler, words to live by. And you know what? I 100% I agree with that, and I aspire to be like that. I can tell you one time I saw App State or last weekend, or yeah, last two weekends ago game, and Josh Bowers makes a phenomenal tackle on the 10-yard line, and I turn around and I see you and your big butt running down the sideline, and I'm like, man, he is being himself, living his fullest life. And I was right over there, too, jumping around. I hit – Bowers so hard, I thought I was going to knock him out. But I was so jacked up because everyone else was so jacked up. No doubt. And again, like I said, I mean, it's just the 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 biggest thing for kids now, obviously, and it's it's no different. Is if what you're telling them is going to help them be a better player, when there's evidence to back that up, and there's there's actual touchable, feelable, verified evidence of that, that's when your that's when your validation comes. And you, you talk about things and you, you harp on things and you coach it. And sometimes you'll never see it on film. It'll never show up. But then there's those key moments, those pivotal, pivotal moments that happen. And, again, that was a huge moment in that game. And to be totally honest, after watching again, that wasn't even a counter return. That was the returner and the officer saying, screw it, we're trying to save, our, save ourselves here because we've been getting our guts ripped out on the boundary return. So he just called his own number. You know, but because Josh did what he's being coached to do, at the level that we coach these guys to do it, he executed at a high level. And again, it's just, it's, it's awesome for the kid because that was his moment. You know, that was his moment to show the world on national television that not only am I a big time player, but also I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do what I'm being coached to do. And the execution obviously was to a T. It's awesome. This is raw emotion. I love it. Okay. Something else that's, that you have that's very unique. You know, what is this gold standard business about? You guys got the t-shirts. They look very nice. I'd like to get one. But talk to us a little bit about the gold standard. Well, you know, I think, you know, obviously this, this business, there's, it, there's so many guys out there that are all buying for the same thing. We're all wanting to continue to move up in the business. We're continuing to want have opportunities. And, you know, to me, I think something that I've, I've made a, a, you know, a big emphasis on in my career is, you know, is unit pride and that unit bond that my positional group has. And, you know, you kind of, you know, you – you, you know, when I was a kid growing up, my dad's teams, you know, we broke every huddle, all for one, one for all, you know, and I still remember that since I was a little kid, you know, my dad coached me in college and hearing his players say that, and I thought that was the coolest thing ever. I mean, it was just such a unique, you know, man, it just makes you just, it just hits you, you know, all for one, one for all, yeah, you know, and I wanted something that, you know, could kind of differentiate us and, and, and our group from, you know, not to put us on a pedestal or put us away from the team goals, you know, but you got to have some unit pride as well. And you got to have some unit swagger as well, you know, and I think, you know, kind of when I first started coaching was kind of, you know, not necessarily the beginnings, but the social media stuff really kind of started to take a hold. And obviously right now, I mean, it's a, it's as big a part of recruiting and coaching as, as, as X's and O's. And, you know, for me, it was, you know, something that I wanted to have that I could carry throughout my career. You know, I didn't want it to be a, well, Hey, we're the tough cats when I'm at Sam Houston and we're the whatever here, you know, it's, it's who we are, you know, and it's amazing to me how much pride the guys take in it. It's amazing to me how much the old, my former players uh, still take pride in it. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's something that the guys, you know, it's, it's not just, uh, it's not just something we say or we put on a shirt. It's, it's a lifestyle, you know, and again, I'm, I'm trying to, I got into this business not to have a certain logo on my shirt or, or coach at a certain school because they play on TV a bunch or none of that stuff. I got in this business because of relationships and wanting to develop kids. And, you know, if you really care about these guys as men and as people, you know, you're going to try to encourage them to be successful in all walks of their life, you know. And, again, that, that gold standard mantra isn't just about, hey, we're the best tight ends on the team and we're the best tight ends in the conference. And we're the best tight ends. It's, it's they're the best students that they can be. They're the best humans they can be. And, again, if these guys grow up to be bad fathers, bad husbands, bad people, then I failed regardless of how good a player they were, you know. And, again, when you have an expectation that high, again, the bar of which all else is measured, the gold standard, you know, that's that's an easy thing and it's a tangible thing for kids to recognize. You got C's and B's in your classes. That ain't that ain't it. You know, it's 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 A's, A's and B's, right? You know, it's that's that's the standard we uphold. And, you know, it's, it's really fun when you get to a place and we're at the point where we are here where those guys believe in it and they're all in on it here that, they start policing themselves 
that's when you realize you've got you've got their hearts and minds, you know, and you and on your side is when they start policing themselves and communicating that to the other guys in the group. If someone starts to slip, that's when you're like, okay, now now we now we're where we want to be here, you know, and and it's also fun. I mean, but you you mentioned it, you know. I mean, we got the freaking we had the sweet long sleeve Nike dry fit with the with the custom, you know, the the logo, and you know, it's it's the talk of talk of the facility, you know, every. O linemen, quarterbacks, skill guys, kickers, everybody wants one, you know, and that's part of being the in the exclusivity of the group, you know, is you, you gotta be you gotta be one of those guys to have one and that's kind of you know, heavy lies the crown, you know, and they wear those they wear those around and again I want them to be reminded that that's that's a that's a twenty four seven deal. It's not just when you walk through these doors. Percent, you know, they uh, yeah, the gold standard is definitely about living the best life you can live, right, and being the best version of yourself, not just in football, but in life in general. No doubt, and I, and again, I, I think I'm I'm a big advocate. I mean, the reason I am who I am is my dad brought me up, and I was raised around my dad's players, and you know, those guys, good, bad, or indifferent, I learned some colorful language. Uh, again, I remember I still remember being a kid going to my dad's practices and going to the dorms and watching. You know, in Living Color and in Martin and watching Martin in the dorm room with my dad's players, you know, and like, again, like that's, that's what I did when I was a kid. And I grew up on those buses and grew up in those locker rooms and that helped me shape who I am as a man today. And I think there's so much more to this than just what happens when they're at this facility. You know, I want them, obviously 2020 is kind of throwing a little bit of a wrench in that from COVID and contact tracing and all that stuff, but I want them to be around my wife. I want them to be around my daughters, you know, because again, I can't make them better men and better people if I don't try to do the best I can every day to show them a positive example of that, you know, and I'm not perfect and I'm far from it. Okay. And I'm, I'm, I'm my real close friends out there will definitely attest to that, you know, but at the same time, you know, it's, it's my responsibility to how can I expect them to be good husbands and good fathers if they don't see what that looks like in person, you know, and they see me when my daughters interact with me and they see me when my wife gets on me, you know, they, they know. And again, it's, it's again, that's part of developing these guys holistically. It's not just, hey, they're great football players, and at, at, when the doors close the facility, that's the end of it, you know. And I think that's something, like I said, I'm, I'm I'm trying to trying to make that a priority with them and for me. And again, a lot of times, if you take care of that stuff, the football and the X's and O's, that sh that'll all come, you know. If if you don't develop them as men and as people, then that stuff's never going to be where you want it to be as football because they're going to be incomplete people off the field. No question. No question. That's really good. How do you, with those guys, you know, you talk about how they're a part of your life and they get to meet your family and that's all good and that's all, all well. How do you show those guys that you really do care about them? Because I think that's one of the players' biggest complaints about coaches nowadays is that, like, you know, this coach doesn't care about me. Well, maybe he does care. He just doesn't really know how to express it. How do you show your guys you truly care about them? Well, I think it's, you know, a lot of times the answer you get from a lot of people and a lot of coaches is time. You know, again, you got to you gotta put in the time with them, you know, and luckily for me, especially like when I came here, you know, and when I was at uh, Monroe before I came here, you know, I was here without a family, you know, I'm literally living in a, you know, one bedroom apartment, you know, I'm up here, I can, I can literally live at the office and between, you know, getting prepared for going out to recruit and all that good stuff, you know, I just, you got to make a time, make a priority to have time with those guys, you know, and spend time with them away from football. You know, you got to go, and it doesn't have to be financial stuff. You know, a lot of time guys in the FCS level or D2 level or even high school, you know, I don't have the means to go buy my guys a steak dinner, you know, and that's not what I'm saying to do either, you know, but you can go buy some hot readies and bring them over to the house and watch a football game or watch a movie and just kind of have some fellowship, you know, and I think if guys see you for who you are, when you are in those moments of teachable moments and you are in that, that, that crucible of it's going to go one way or the other, he's going to take the coach and he's going to get better, or he's going to turn into the sour kid who coach is screwing me. And, and he's just, he's just, he's just hard on me because he, he doesn't like me. When you're in that moment, that's when you, you get those kids to, to you really reach them is if you do, un, they do understand, like you said, that, that this is not just a guy who's here to coach me and, and catch a check. And, you know, I think that's the hardest part nowadays is the business has become competitive and there's movement in this business and movement in the profession, you know, and it's hard. You know, I was only at Louisiana Monroe for a year, you know, and it was hard for me to leave. I didn't have to leave. You know, it was a situation that I loved my head coach. I loved my guys. And it was just, for me, the situation and to come to a place like Marshall and be here was, 
something that I felt after talking with my family that it was something I needed to do. And, you know, that's hard. It's hard to look a group of guys in the eye and tell them that you're leaving, you know. But at the end of the day, the thing that helped me the most transition here and go into this thing with an open heart and an open mind was every single one of those guys there all, you know, again, hugged me around the neck. Coach, I'm, I'm happy for you. I'm fired up for you. You know, and again, as coaches, we don't need a pat on the back. I don't need, I don't need somebody to tell me I'm doing a good job. As long as I know in my heart in my, in, that I'm doing a good job, I'm good with it, you know. But having that verification from something like that, you know, to make such a hard decision, an easier decision, and you feel better about it, again, is all the – that's all all you need, you know. And at the same time, like I said, it's just, you know, guys know if you're being honest with them, you know. And I coach every single one of these guys a little bit different, you know. And it's not the same old days where I coach them all the same. You know, guys have different personalities. Guys have different quirks and different – motivations and that's your job as a coach to spend time with them and find what those are and when you find those idiosyncrasies for each kid that's when you're truly going to be successful as a group and it's not just in your own position group you know you got to know how to coach certain guys on on special teams you know and it's 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 different you know I'm not in the room with the corners I'm not in the room with the linebackers but I coach those guys every day you know and it's you've got to find the way to coach those guys and reach those guys and Again, if at the end of it they feel that it's coming from a place of, uh, place of again respect, and it's a place of again understanding that this is what's best for you, and I want what's best for you. Typically, like I said, they'll they'll, they'll do what you ask with that at a high level. Yes, yeah, and you know something that made me think of that is you guys have a very, uh, you know, very interesting, very diverse group of tight ends there just in your room alone. You know, how do you handle and and think about in the past too. How do you handle situations where a guy's having a bad day? You know, how do you motivate them if they're not feeling motivated? How do you get them inspired to go out there and put in those work when it's hot outside and, you know, they don't want to be there? Well, you know, again, it's kind of the dynamic has changed a lot since since I've been coaching, um, you know, especially at the FCS level. I had some really quality, you know, scholarship guys. But, you know, at at my time at Sam Houston, you know, some of my best players were walk-ons. I mean, it's just tough, hard-nosed kids who love ball, you know, and those coaching those guys, obviously early in my career and kind of those more just kids who love the game, blue collar type kids, you know, you know, kind of spoils you, you know, because they come with their lunch bell every day. You know, they're paying their way to do this and because they love ball, you know, and then you get to, you know, I get to different places, you know, and, I, and you said it, you know, I've got some, some different guys. I've got some really dynamic special athletes and different skill sets, you know, but again, it's just about, your relationship with each one of those guys, you know, and it's your job as a coach to make those guys excited about work every day. It's your job as a coach to make them want to please you in the sense of if I don't show up and work to the level that I'm expected, I'm letting coach down. And if you don't have that relationship and you haven't cultivated that relationship with your guys, you're going to get those high and low days. You're going to get the, well, he was pretty good today, but boy, I hope he shows up tomorrow, you know, and and that's part of this part of this business, you know, and it's, and kids are all different. You know, you've got guys that they don't need any motivation. They show up every day like it's the Super Bowl and they're bouncing off the walls and you just wind them up and let them go, you know, and then there's other guys that you got to, you got to prod a little bit. You got to find that, that motivation. And again, you know, that's to me is so much about the dynamic in the room and the interpersonal relationship in the room that, you know, there is, I'm, I'm not going to let coach down. I'm not. And also it's that unit bond, as I mentioned too, I'm not going to let my, my, my brothers in the room down because, you know, again, if, if one guy in the room has Fs on his, on his grade check, that's, that looks bad on all of us. You know, if, if one guy dogs it in practice and he, or he pulls himself out of something, well, that means that's more reps for somebody else. And that's, that's, not, that's not acceptable in the room either, you know. And, again, you have that culture within a culture, if you will, you know, culture in your room within the program's culture, you know, that's where, you know, you don't have to worry about that as much, you know. And it's a personality trait too, you know. I mean, again, that's – I think my guys – appreciate the fact, like I said, you know, that I'm not, I, I'm not a, I'm not a high low guy either. You know, they're going to get the same dude every day. And so it's hard, it's hard to not be the same dude as well every day. If, if I'm, if I'm steady, you know, if I'm, if I'm high, if I'm low, then, then they're, they're going to go as, as I go, you know? And so again, to me, it's the trying to be consistent guy, you know, every day and how I approach things and how I work and how I deal with them. Usually that's something that helps, you know, you avoid some of those issues that you're talking about. Yeah. And I think you said it with the consistency thing. You know, at least for me personally, I've always, my, my parents have always said I'm a very even kill guy, you know, and I try to be that 
you know, don't get too high with successes and don't get too down with the defeats, you know, just try to stay on the same level. So the guys know what to expect from you. And they know that you're going to be a source of that confidence and that, you know, just uh, someone they can go to when times get tough. No doubt. No doubt. Well, you know, Coach Seeger, we're, we're wrapping it up a little bit here, but, uh, you know, I still got a few questions here for you. Uh, and I'll, I'll kind of hit you with them a little bit quicker. Uh, you know, coming into a, a new school and becoming the special teams coordinator or just becoming a coach at a new school, what is a big mistake that you see guys tend to make? I think, you know, the biggest thing is, is you know, you got to, you got to put your spin on things and you got to do things how you want to do it, but also don't do that to your own detriment. You know, if there's a, if there's something that they've been doing, that's been a highly successful part of their program or a certain style of how they do things that you may not be familiar with, but you know, it's been very successful to them. Don't start from ground zero on everything. You know, you don't have to, you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time you go to a place, you know, and, Again, you know, case in point, you know, whenever I came here, you know, we were, were a two-man shield operation on punt. I've never been a part of that. I've always been a traditional three-man shield guy because I knew that in and out, and I knew what to expect and what to, what were your issues and problems with that. And I came here and opened mind and looked at it, and, and I love what we do here. You know, I think it's awesome. It opens a lot of doors and gets more athleticism on the field, you know. And, again, I think you've got to – you got to do your spin on things and how you want things to be associated with you, but also you can't – you can't get wrapped up and I'm just going to just live or die with what I do and whether it works or not, it's what I do, you know. And, again, prime example is, you know, when, when Tim Cramsey came with us at Sam Houston, you know, he, he learned our terminology from a verbal standpoint and we called the offense how we had worded it prior to his arrival but it was his his spin on the offense, and it was it was his 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 call sheet, you know. And he adapted to it. And I always had a, a ton of respect for Tim on that, and the fact that he's like, no, it's easier for me to learn it one person and keep the consistency and the and the and the and the continuity with the kids. You know, it's a lot easier for for me to grind and me to put in the time to do it rather than all right, ninety five guys got to learn this new deal because this is what I want to do. You know, and again, it's. It's, it's about the group success. It's not about you as the coordinator, you know, and I think that's something that, you know, part of the reason why I really, you know, I, I've, I've enjoyed being on special teams. You know, the special teams coordinator is a lot like the offensive line. You don't ever hear about the special teams coordinator unless they block a punt. You know, you don't ever hear about the special teams coordinator unless some guy fumbles the kick return. You know, that's when you hear about them. You know, when you don't hear about them, it's just like good offensive lines. You know, you don't ever hear about how good they are when the quarterback's back there patting the ball and throwing it downfield. You know, I mean, it's just – it's the same mentality. It's the same deal. And I think that's kind of why that, that, that kinship, I think, kind of drew me to it. And I've enjoyed doing it, you know. But that's the biggest thing is just, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to force everything of how you want to do things from day one, you know. And, again, you got to – you have a thing, too. You got to, you know, you got to you got to also help with people who are there of knowing who your players are, too. You know, a lot of times guys, you know, that's the hardest part coming to a new place. You don't know guys' names. You don't know their skill sets. You don't know anything, you know. And, allow people hopefully that were there prior to you if there is a carryover on the staff to hey this guy's really good at this or this guy he's not very good at this technique I probably play him on this phase rather than this phase you know and sometimes that helps as well you know but just don't don't force things you know if it feels right go with it if you feel like you're forcing it you're probably forcing it you are probably forcing it like that all right speed round here we go what was the biggest win in your career biggest win in my career uh I'd say uh other than two weeks ago against App State, uh, I'd say probably the biggest win in my career would be 2012 uh, when we beat Eastern Washington to go to the national championship. Okay, good. Biggest loss or, or most crushing loss? Uh, easy. James Madison, 2016. Not even close. Yeah. What was your uh, best coaching experience? Might have been a relationship or just the bonds you've made with people? Uh, you know, I, we had a blast at Sam Houston. We had some really great staffs. I mean, obviously, we got a phenomenal staff here, and I love it here. I mean, that that small window when I was at Louisiana Monroe, uh, I mean, we we had a complete just a complete blast. I mean, it was so much fun. Personalities on all sides of the ball, uh, the dynamic on the staff was just dynamite. And I mean, all I, all those dudes, we all still keep in touch. We still 
mean, we literally have our group chat from 2018 still alive today because you know, we got such good relationships. So I'd say that that year was pretty special. That's definitely a highlight for sure. Uh, what about a low light or maybe a time when you're like, man, I don't know if this coaching thing, I'm going to keep doing this. Uh, I'd say, uh, I'd say early in my career, um, you know, being an unpaid volunteer coach, you know, I, I had a master's degree and, you know, I was working, I was working as a, as a bouncer at the local watering hole in Huntsville, Texas. And the same one I worked at when I was playing in undergrad, you know, and, you know, you got a master's degree and you're, you're working until three or four in the morning, sweeping up floors and throwing away beer bottles, you know, it makes you, makes you second guess. Am I really, what am I really doing this for, you know, and obviously, you know, being at the position I am now, I mean, it makes you savor it and appreciate it that much more because you remember, you know, you remember where you came from. Aren't you glad you stuck it out that watering hole? Yeah, all the the Jolly Fox RIP. You know, it's it's it's, it's definitely uh, it's definitely a special place in my heart. Went out for the Jolly Fox. That's right. You know, something kind of winding down here, but this has been you know awesome. In a 2015 interview, uh, you said that if you weren't coaching, you would be an actor or a comedian. Now, if you had the opportunity, coach, to do a five-minute stand-up set, okay, would you? And what would it be about? Wow. Boy, I have thought about that a lot more than I probably should think or, or say out loud. Um, you know, I uh, one of my favorite stories and probably my lead joke, and this sounds awful uh, to say, uh, but uh, my, in the early stages in my uh, courtship of my wife, uh, I was a poor college kid, you know, um, just trying to figure out what to do, and it was her birthday. And uh, I, uh, you know, as oftentimes happens, you know, you see, you know, especially in, in back back home, you know, you drive by Walmart and there's, you know, people who raise puppies and they sell puppies outside in Walmart, you know, and I still remember how just freaking brutally hot it was one day in the spring and I'm scrambling, I'm like, dude, I don't got no money, I got to find a birthday gift for my, for my girl and I'm like, you know what, screw it. So I go over and I see, and they, I mean, it was just, just the most, just, runt slash you know just complete mutt dog you've ever seen in your life and it was the last one and the gal was like you know I was like hey, I don't have any cash can I write you a check and I literally wrote a freaking check for uh you know I, I joke because it was so hot outside a freaking heat stroke puppy to buy for my wife and her future wife and uh but I mean I bought I got a bow at the dollar store I freaking wrapped it around the thing took it over there and of course, it was right after she got out of softball practice. All of her roommates and teammates were over there, and I walk in. Here I am, this this, this good looking, heavy set fella holding a puppy in his arm, and it's like, I mean, I was like the Fonz for like ten minutes. It was awesome. I mean, but uh, you know, I, I do I do enjoy entertaining. Uh, there's no no question about that. If you've been around me for five minutes, you can probably figure that out. You know, but uh, but I just like to have fun. I like to make people laugh, and you know, I definitely think uh, you know probably a little bit stressed, less stressful career path if I'd have done something like that. But uh, but it still has its 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 points and, and perks in this business. You still you still have some opportunities to to have the stage and make some people laugh. So the heat stroke puppy, yeah, and you know, I always felt that uh, you know when you do your your presentations or when you you know you're with the team, that is a little bit of a you know stand up routine. You know, you you definitely and Hankins. I don't know who's funnier. I think it'd be me if I stood up there, but you guys definitely do a great job of keeping it lighthearted up there when you, uh, you know, hit them with some zingers. So, no doubt, you got to keep it light. You're up there every day. They, they, I mean, no matter how entertaining you are, they get tired of hitting you at some point. So, you got to keep the mood light and keep them on their toes. You know, I've actually told my family and close friends that I was going to do a stand up set. So, let's go find an open mic and we'll uh, go bust it out. There you go. No doubt. Hey, you know, one of the last things here, and, and this is something on a more serious note, I've thought about a lot, you know, as a young coach is, is how do you balance that family time now with, you know, your family's now here and you have a, you know, a young daughter. Uh, sometimes things happen and you aren't able to make practice, but how do you balance that time of, of, you know, being with the team and then also making your wife and making your family feel like they're also, you know, involved and, and valued? Well, I think I, I talked about it a little bit earlier. You know, again, I think part of the the double side of the coin there, if you will, of, of having my players around my family so they can see me interact with them and see, you know, a positive male role model and what that's supposed to look like. You know, it's also it's 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 a dual dual fold for them. You know, again, I want if they're invested in those in the in those boys and those men, excuse me, then they're going to have a lot more understanding about the time 
you know, the time that I have to, to be up here and the time that it takes to be a coach at this level. Um, you know, I think part of it also is, you know, everybody says it and it's, it's true. You know, a coach's wife is a very, very rare breed of human, and it takes a very special person to be able to do that. It's easy for me. My wife was a substantially better athlete than me in college, and uh, she understands the time. Um, if you don't have that background, I, I feel like that'd be really hard, uh, especially for a significant other to understand. Like, why? I mean, you know, why are you up there that much? What are y'all doing? You know, and because my wife was a Division One college athlete, there's no, there's no misnomer there. She, she gets it, you know. And I think it's just, you know. Part of the fun of, again, like I talked about my experience of growing up, going to the games, going to practices and being a part of that, you know, that I wouldn't change my childhood experiences for anything, you know, and the excitement and the joy that my daughter has of the boys having success and being around them and, and cheering for them, you know, is something that, again, that's that's as beneficial as, as you know, as, as a lot of things you can do as a parent, you know, as she understands that this is this is bigger than daddy. It's, it's, it's about these, 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 these guys and, and making them better people and having them around. And, you know, it's, it's, it's hard and it's, there's no real way to easy way to answer the question. You know, it's hard. You got to find your balance. You got to find what you do. And again, I've been lucky, you know, all, I haven't had a head coach that's you know, a guy that doesn't understand the family piece of it, you know, and again, it's just, you've got to find times and find ways to make it happen. And if you have a spouse like I do that is able to, you know, work things around and do things, you know, have them come up here to have lunch, you know, have them come up here and spend some time, you know, after the game and, and, and do those things, you know, you make everyone involved and you make it an us thing rather than a dad thing. And we're just kind of hanging out, you know, it's a little bit easier, uh, manageable for everybody. Um, and you gotta, you gotta be able to, to, to unplug it. You know, I think that's the biggest thing to me that I've, I have, I've taken a lot of pride in, especially since I've become a parent um, that, you know, when I come home, it's dad. There's no, there's no football coach. There's no, there's no bad practices. There's no wins and losses. It's, it's I'm dad. And I can't be pride myself on being even keel and being the same guy with my players every day and go home and be, you know, be, you know, take it home with me and be grouchy dad or grouchy husband because we had a bad day of ball practice. You know, I think that's something too, that, you know, you got to be able to unplug and, and you gotta, you gotta make that a priority. You know, if you don't do that, it'll sneak up on you and you'll, you'll end up being something you don't want to be. You know, and I think that's something to me is just, you know, I'm also a guy that I, I, I've got hobbies. You know, I like playing golf. I like, you know, going to the park with the fam and, and doing stuff with them, you know, and you've got to make time for that stuff. You know, in the off season, it's easy to just want to unwind and veg and not do anything. But you know, especially now, my, my oldest daughter, you know, she's got soccer and she's, she's doing sports and dance and I'm going to recitals and going to soccer practices when I can. And you just, it stretches you a little thin, but at the end of the day, you know, that stuff is, is vitally important to their development. And it's just, it's hard, but you got to make it a priority. And I, and I think the relationship part of it with, the, with these guys and having them in the fold with the family too, I mean, it's so much more investment for my family, you know, cause they want to see them be successful. And again, it just shows, it shows again, you know, my, my oldest daughter is starting to understand that like, there's a reason why she knows where daddy is when he's not home. I'm with, I'm with the boys, you know, she knows their name. She, she, she talks to them after the game and because of the connection there and her relationship with them too, it's not a big deal when dad's not around as much, you know, it's, it is a big deal, but it's not as big a deal, you know? And so it's, you got to make it a priority. And again, to me, I, at the end of the day, I say it all the time to anybody who listen, I don't care at the end of the day, when they put me in the ground, if you think I'm a rotten coach, that's fine. I don't care. As long as somebody says that if they think I'm a good husband and a good dad, then and I've and I've done my best to develop these guys that I've coached over the years, then then I, I that's 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 the end game. That's the goal. You know, if if I'm a rotten dad and a rotten husband, but I'm a hell of a football coach, that 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 ain't what I'm in it for. So, well, and it sounds like you have the right one supporting you. That's awesome. And are you any good at golf? Uh, I would say I'm definitely the best golfer on this staff or any staff I've ever been a part of. Um, and uh, that, that is directed specifically at Coach Hankins, as well as the quarterback room here at Marshall. Um, but, yeah, no, I've, I grew up playing since I was a little kid. And, uh, you know, I've, I've, I'm, definitely, uh, I'm definitely no slouch on the golf course. Good. And you coaches, you're put on notice. We'll have to see this uh, in person. Hey, well, one of the last things, too, here is you got the unique distinction of being an AFCA 35 for 35 coach. Uh, you know, name for us one of the cool perks and, and you know, what that kind of was like to you uh, briefly. 
Well, I mean, obviously it's our national governing body, you know, selected me to be in that. Um, you know, again, it's, it's very hard to talk about at times because it kind of, you know, again, it's an individual accolade, which, you know, not necessarily my deal, you know, but obviously it's a very huge honor and it was an unbelievable experience. Um, the biggest thing for me that obviously, you know, I, I took the most from it is it just, this, this profession is about giving back and this profession is about making it, you know, and, it's, and this is my belief on anything you do in life, you leave it better than you found it. And, you know, right now, football, even with what's going on in the world, you know, football is, is a beacon of hope and a beacon of, of, of prosperity in a, in a very trying time for our, our country. You know, we've got COVID right now. We've got a crazy election coming up with whatever the hell that was the other night, you know, in the debate, you know, it, it, it's just, again, right now, the one thing that has unified more groups of people from different walks of life is the greatest game in the world, which is football. And to me, I'm forever linked now to the AFCA. I'm forever linked to this game. And, and that it's my obligation to do what I can to give back. And, you know, I think being a part of that, that 35 on the 35 class and that group, um, you know, each year, you know, we're, we're affiliated with the new class. Um, you know, I had the blessing last year. I got to speak to the, to the class uh, from last year, you know, and I mean, what a cool honor to, to sit in front of the next class of the 35 under 35 and talk to them and, and give my person, my point of view and give my perspective on some things. And, and it's also, you know, it's a, it's, it's a unique opportunity to, to network with other coaches. You know, I've, I've, through, through this last year, when I talked to the to last year's class, I Zoom, had Zoom clinics and, develop, and professional development with probably seven or eight guys that I spoke to in that deal that I never would have talked to or met or known otherwise. You know, and to me, I mean, how cool is that? Not only do I get to have relationships and, and, and dynamics with, with new coaches that I, that I didn't know before, but also I'm, I'm getting better as a coach. You know, so, I mean, it's, it's – I can't say enough about Mario Price and, and those guys that, that put that on. I think it's probably one of the best things in our in our national governing body that they do, um, because again, it's we're we're the future of this business, and I think the people that I was in my class with this last year's class, and obviously the upcoming class, you know, again, we're we, we got some some guys that are going to help continue to push this game forward for all of us for for many years to come. So I'm I'm pretty like I said, I'm, it's unbelievable uh, honor and opportunity to be a part of it. A great honor and it's an awesome honor working with someone who uh, has accomplished that so kudos to you there um you know all right we're wrapping up here what is a, a motivational quote i know you you read a lot you've got a lot of success coaches quote uh talk to us about a motivational quote and then just briefly advice to young guys out there uh motivational quote um you know, to me, I think it's, it's as far as, you know, your approach to, to coaching in this game, you know, I, I'm, I'm a big advocate, you know, and I'm, I, it's on the wall in my meeting room downstairs, my position room, you know, if, if you want peace, prepare for war, you know, and I think if you're in the game, I mean, you hear all the best coaches, most successful coaches talk about it. If you're a manic guy on the sideline, if you're a high, low, oh my, you know, up and down guy, it's because you probably didn't prepare the way you needed to prepare or you didn't prepare your players the way you needed to prepare, you know, and we do that all the time. We talk about it in special teams here all the time. You know, we're going to prepare our guys for all, all opportunities and all scenarios to where when it is time, when the bullets are flying, that, that moment of clarity hits them and they're able to execute at a high level, you know, and I think again, to me, that's something that it's, it's applicable to, to just how you approach coaching. You know, again, if you're constantly, Again, I, I take a lot of pride in an off season, and when we have time, I'm, I'm I'm talking to guys. I'm trying to get better myself because I don't have all the answers. You know, I'm 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 trying to. You mentioned it. I'm I'm trying to better myself as a person. You know, I'm trying. I'm I'm reading more. I'm doing more research on things that aren't even related to football. You know, because again, I want to be a better holistic person. Then that means I can be a better coach. You know, and again, kind of advice to young guys: um, don't ever be too big to do do the little things. You know, again, it's it's, it's, you're not going to walk out of being a GA and be the OC at Alabama. It just ain't going to happen, dude. So if it does, hey, good for you and good luck, you know, but the guys who I have in my, in my phone is guys who, if I ever have the opportunity to hire a staff as a coordinator, as a head coach, the guys that I have in my phone that I'm going to call are guys that aren't too good to do stuff. And nowadays, a lot of times, you know, you've got young coaches that, They've got all the answers and they can call ball plays and they want that headset on Saturdays, but they don't want to, they don't want to do the little stuff. They don't want to wash clothes. They don't want to do laundry. 
or excuse me, line fields. They don't want to. They don't want to do that stuff because that's below them. They're here to call football plays, and it's like, dude, the guys who do that stuff and have the opportunity to do that, if they're ever, if they ever get the opportunity to do that, have cut their teeth, you know, doing the little things that you're too good to do, you know. And again, that's that's something that if you're if you're that guy, you know, you're you're never going to achieve the success you want. And again, to me, I think the biggest thing too is just appreciate appreciate all the things that, that you got in front of you man you know again I, I'll never forget when I went from coaching at Sam Houston you know winning more games and in, in, in that time period than other than Alabama and Clemson and North Coast State we won more games in that that 10 year period than anybody you know and I go to Louisiana Monroe and I've got my own position meeting room and I about fell down I mean I was just blown away I was like wait a minute I, I don't meet in my office I don't watch film with my guys in my office I have a meeting room like I remember how much I called my wife from the meeting. I was like, babe, like you're not going to believe this. I got a freaking meeting room, you know, and stuff like that. If you appreciate things like that and you just, you savor those moments, you know, one day if, you know, hopefully I get to continue to move up and I am one day coaching for the Dallas Cowboys. I mean, I'm going to just sit in my desk like a little kid every day and just be like, holy cow, like, can you believe this? Like I, I get to freaking coach here, you know, and, again, part of that, when, by you, when you appreciate those little things and appreciate those fine things like that, you know, that also helps you keep, keeps you grounded. You know, you, you know, hear a lot of, a lot of old coaches say, you know, coach where your feet are, you know, don't chase, don't chase the next one, coach your ass off where you're at and, and be the best you you can be. Then that stuff will find you. You know, if you're constantly looking for the next deal, you're never going to be, you know, the best you you can be and you're never going to give that high level product that you need to the kids and that they deserve, you know? So that's, that's kind of my best, best info for, for young, but. Be where you're at speak the Cowboys job into existence and free work, get on the scout cards for tomorrow because we're going to need them. Do anything you can to help out. No doubt. Awesome. Awesome. Well, coach, it's been a great time. I'm so glad you came on, even though you laughed at me the first time I brought it up, but we are honored to have you here on this podcast. Is there anything you'd like to plug uh, before you leave? Is there anywhere these people can follow you on Twitter or email? Yeah, uh, I'm on Twitter, obviously. Uh, I'm at coach underscore Siegler. That's S-E-G-L-E-R. Um, you can, like I said, you can follow me on there. Uh, I got a lot of coaches, high school coaches, college guys. Just DM me, obviously. Uh, that way, you know, if there's something you want to talk about schematically or just call and shoot the bull, um, we'll get in touch on there. Um, and then, obviously, I'm just on bated breath to get Coach Hankins on here because, obviously, we know we know we got to have Coach Hankins on here at some point. So we'll hopefully, we'll talk about a big time ball coach. We got to get we got to get Coach Hankins on here. Yeah, I think this is going to set him over the edge. I think this is going to get him on. So thanks so much, Coach. Uh, you know, it's been a great time. Have a good one. Yeah, man. Go hurt. Thanks for listening. And if you have any questions you'd like asked or select guests coming up, follow and send us a message on Twitter and Instagram to Iceman underscore Kicking or icemancaking at gmail.com. Be sure to follow us and turn notifications on YouTube, Spotify, and SoundCloud at Iceman Kicking Podcast, and rate and review us on Apple Music. This will be important as we will have giveaways going forward. Also, check out our TikTok under the same name for the best clips from these interviews. And tune in next week for another great special teams mind. I'm Brett Arkellian, and for everyone at the Iceman Kicking Podcast, we hope you stay cool under pressure. Have a great week.